Greetings, Earthlings. Welcome to Celestial Compass. I'm Kathy Beal of EmpowermentUnlimited.net. We are going to have fun today. Today's topic is It's Showtime. And I am joined by a frequent collaborator and a, a good friend, Donna Woodwell. Uh, for those of you who have not run into Donna yet, I will review her brief bio. Though Donna Woodwell attended grad school to become a foreign correspondent, she had no idea how foreign she'd get. After exploring ancient and modern astrological, magical, and mystical practices for more than 25 years, she teaches witches, pagans, and astrologers how to unleash their unique genius into the world at her magic school, magicandmastery.com. Hey ho, Donna, welcome. Heidi Ho there. I was so positively mundane here in a basement. And you're like out among the stars. Well, that's where I tend to be. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a facade, Pisces rising. If you look, <laughs> look too closely, you'll see what's really there. A bunch of sock monkeys. And don't think I'm making that up. <laughs> uh, so we are talking today just for fun about astrology in movies and maybe TV. Um, I thought about some stuff off the top of my head and also did a little research and then you invoked the power of AI. I came up with some really funny stuff. Um, I myself am not, I have not encountered a lot of astrology in movies, except the first one was through you. Um, you had a watch party a few years back for a film that is completely based on astrology. When were you born? 1938. Care to say anything about that? Um, well, that is probably the clearest example of astrology in the movies almost since then. There are a couple of other examples on the list, but um, that was commissioned by Manly P. Hall, uh, who, if you are an esotericist, you are familiar with him. He wrote the giant compendium that came out in the you know early part of the 20th century um, about the magic teachings of all ages. Um, and he he managed a metaphysical center in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And he used his connections with the Hollywood community to get himself a gig on putting together a film noir show about solving a mystery where all of the characters have astrological signs. And the main detective um, was Anna Mae Wong, who was probably the first massively popular uh, Chinese American film actress. Um, so it is black and white. And super fun, but it's only about uh, 65, 70 minutes. And I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. I, if you like astrology and you like that genre, I would definitely suggest you check it out because it's really funny. In a, the banker is a is a, you know, a Capricorn and so on. It's it's all of the classical stereotypes that you would think about astrological signs all put into one movie. And she solves the crime based yes, on. The astrological sign the, just the sun sign all right this is not high proof this is not highly technical astrology going on here no completely stereotypical is it a spoiler to reveal who the murderer is or everyone can just guess uh, uh, I, I never reveal those kinds of things so <laughs> <laughs> i don't watch and tell <laughs> whoa so um anything jump out at you where would you like to start with this um well, I think when we start this huge topic of astrology in movies or television or astrology in pop culture, it might help to frame it a little bit for how it shows up in general. And okay. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm really interested in the way you think about it because you're much more of a film connoisseur than I am. Um, it seems to me as you scan through the list, there's the big category of astrology as superstition. And then there's the second big category as astrology as philosophy. Um, so astrology as, super, as, as superstition has myriad entries where the characters either in a comedic place use it as a, as a, a stepping stone for making fun of the characters, making fun of their belief in astrology or um, 
or making fun of the coincidences that the, that the characters end up finding themselves in. Or on the horror, si the horror side of that equation, you know, spooky things happen and therefore everyone goes crazy and it's it's terrifying and scary. So we have that like things in that genre that we can explore till the cows come home. Some of them I really think are terribly amusing. Um, and then there's the category of astrology as philosophy, where it brings in like, what is fate? What is free will? And where is the divide between the two of them? What is our agency and what is governed by the stars as a metaphor? So if you expand the definition of astrology a little bit farther beyond, a lot of times it taps into those concepts about where fate plays into our human condition. And so we can put movies in that category, which may not even mention astrology very often, but it's kind of lurking mm -hmm. in the background. Um, what do you think? I was, okay, when I, when I first thought of this topic, I was thinking of astrologer characters and those are very rare. And, yeah. I, and I, will, I will get to your point in a second, but the first one that occurred to me, uh, only people of a certain age are going to remember. And that is in the BBC long, uh, it was very long series called I, Claudius, based on Robert Graves's book uh, about the Roman emperors and then ultimately Claudius. And when we get to the section on Tiberius, Tiberius has an astrologer that he keeps demanding information out of and the guy is giving him the truth. And uh, Tiberius doesn't like it and is threatening to throw him off a cliff for telling him what is about to happen to him. So that one is believing it. And he has these big geometric tools that he's using and he's moving them back and forth. That's the only thing I can think of where there was an astrologer as a character. But if you expand it in the way you're looking at it, um, it seems to me that uh, there's also a third grouping of movies that reflect the astrology of a certain place or time uh, yeah. without necessarily saying that they're doing it. Uh, and that is a, that's a much bigger and more complicated one, but there are, there have been times. And I think I discussed this with you over the phone where I have suspected that there's been an astrologer in the writer's room. Uh, <laughs> for example, the final season of better call Saul has the plot point occur on Jimmy McGill's, 50th birthday. And I saw that and went, boy, this sure smells like a Chiron return to me. And it set off a whole series of actions that led to him tripping on himself and getting caught. And that led me to, well, does he have a birthday? Well, guess what? He does. He has a birthday. He has a birthplace. And if you dig around a whole lot, you can actually find that uh, his wife also has one and it all fits. So I had, you know, I became possessed, which happens every now and again. And I wrote like these 5,000 word essay on medium about, uh, and I kept trying to send it to people about, look, 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 cosmic Easter eggs. And <laughs> you gotta be a real maniac to want to look at this. So that's another category. All right. And that I think is just way too big. Like that's, that's, that's meta astrology in uh, movies. Like, is there somebody who knows what they're doing behind this and sometimes i do think that and other times it just kind of eh. but you know you had an example of that one too we'll just go ahead and dive into it captain kirk james t kirk yes i did so um backstory for star trek um when they wrote the original series they assigned uh william shatner's birth date to the character he was playing captain kirk and then they gave him the birth year that was appropriate to the setting of the story. And the birthplace they gave him was a fictional town in, I believe, Iowa. And so what an astrologer needs to create a birth chart is a date, a year, and a place. And so here we have information in the, in the Star Trek universe of a date and a place and a time for when Captain Kirk was born. So you can actually last a chart for that moment. Um, but remember, I just said that they gave him a fictional birthplace in Iowa. So it didn't exist. But since Star Trek was launched, these enterprising town members decided to rechristen their town after 
uh, James Kirk's fictional birthplace so that they could get the tourism of people wanting to visit where James Kirk was born. So if you take the you take the time of birth of, of William Shatner and put it in the year of Star Trek and this fictional city that has been rechristened and you put them all together, you get a chart that actually looks like James Kirk. It has a grand fire trine, which is astrology speak for lots of lots of energy to boldly go. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a Leo, it, it's a Leo uh, sun with an Aries moon and a Sagittarius rising. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's a, it's an Aries sun. It's an Aries sun with a Leo rise, a Leo moon and um, Sagittarius rising. So who wrote that? The, co the, the cosmic author wrote that because nobody did it on purpose. It's just the way that it worked out. And when you see things like that, you, you have to think back to that famous line from the next generation where Wesley is talking to the traveler. I was looking at your equation. You think that space and time and thought are not entirely the separate things we think that they are. And the traveler says, no, no, young child, don't say those kinds of things in a world that's not ready to accept them. Something along those lines. Um, and so I think that brushes into that philosophical conversation about what astrology actually is. And if it's the stuff of invisible threads that bind our actions to a larger archetypal story, then astrology is really happening everywhere. Um, it's it's in the charts of the launches for films and television shows. It's it's in the way the characters are produced. I swear that they blue our planets. We'll talk about that later. Um, but you can't like move away from that if you're really looking at the totally big picture, which, you know, of course, astrologers like to do, you know? Of course, of course. So getting back to your initial, it's not that I've completely derailed the conversation, but it doesn't matter because we can talk about whatever we want. Uh, your initial thought of, uh, is it that it's a sort of spooky superstitious thing or that, that strand in movies and then the strand of Humor. Philosophical. Well, the humor, that is a big one too. <laughs> Superstition can be can be horror or humor. That's true. For different reasons. And then the, the philosophy behind them. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have a few specific films that I turned up uh, that kind of actually straddle this uh joel schumacher made a movie called five star day about a guy who has this birthday forecast that just sounds like it's the most amazing amazing day and year possible and then everything goes opposite of what has happened have you seen this i have not i've just i probably... have not seen it either i hear it's not very good um but i get it. it's hard to say when you haven't seen it so yeah, I'm sure if anyone out there has, they will let me know. Uh, Jackie Chan, now this is not surprising. Jackie Chan made a movie he directed, he was in, in 2012 called Chinese Zodiac. And it involves uh, brass uh, figurines of each of the animals of the Chinese Zodiac and the heads are missing. And so he is now looking for these ancient, ancient symbols. So they're just a I'm not so sure that the astrology plays into the actual plot of the film. It's just that this is the this is the plot piece. This is the point that was put into it. I haven't seen this one either. I'm assuming you have not. Um, no, I have not. Seen okay. That. All right. Um, I like Jackie Chan, so he's fun. He is fun. So we know that this is probably going to be amusing. Um, I, your, uh, this chat GPT list mentioned a film that I suspect you have seen practical magic. Oh yes. I, I would put that on the, um, astrology as a background atmosphere for spooky magical things. And there are lots of examples of, you know, whether they're horror movies or comedies that, you know, you need something to make the plot go forward so you see the tarot reader. You know, when they flip over the cards and oh, and in the background you might see ast astrological stuff. Or maybe that instead of a tarot reader, they do go see an astrologer and they're moving things around to make it cool. And I'm not sure they count as like true explorations of astrology or just the fact that astrology has always been around. Um, and 
it sounds to me like it's just part of the set decor in that kind of movie. Yeah. I think that's much well, movie, They were watching the moon go, you know, dimmer and dimmer and that kind of stuff. And so if you think about, you know, the role of eclipses and things as astrological, because astrologers use them, then they're probably even in, like, in, if you think of heroes, that movie with like all those characters, they had an eclipse and they all got superpowers. And is that astrological? It kind of depends on how you define astrology. Okay. Uh, have you seen Teen Witch? I have seen several of the uh, of the versions, yes. And is this also just set decor? Is astrology just set decor? In yeah, yeah, it is in most things. Okay, now there's one. There are actually two on this list that I have seen, uh, and one of them now makes sense to me. I should have realized there was an astrological piece to it, and one just went by me completely. Um, Stardust. Uh, Neil Gaiman. Yes, he, yeah. Neil Gaiman throws fun things in his movies. What was so astrologically inspired about the characters in that one? Um, I think it's more of a it's more of a just a background set piece. It's not like they're zodiac signs. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are movies on that list that are more closely tied to the philosophy that created astrology. The two of them I think of is the, um, the Golden Compass series, right? I thought, and the Adjustment Bureau. Okay. Uh, because both of those are tied up in the same Western philosophy that Plato created that is used to um, really explain how astrology could possibly work. Um, so I would put those on the list of, you know, if you were giving someone an astrological theory lesson, you might be able to use either of those movies to fill in some of the blanks. So how does the Adjustment Bureau fit into that? Um, the Adjustment Bureau is basically, you know, there is folks up in the sky with a big plan. And when you jump down here into physical incarnation, you are somewhere in part of that plan. Um, but the powers that be have the power to change and adjust that plan. And if you think of the plan as the movements of all of the planets, mm -hmm. then it becomes a, okay, I can see how astrology would fit into the world where this occurs. Um, the golden compass, each person has their own, uh, they call them demons in the movie, but the word demon comes from the Greek word daimon. And daimon just means um, your, like your divine spark, your divine other. And it's what you, when you come into incarnation, you choose your chart and you jump down and your diamond kind of takes care of you to make sure you stay on the path. So it's a movie that has a physical representation of your diamond in the form of an animal that, that evolves and shifts until you become a, an adult and then you're like fixed on your path. Um, so it's kind of an interesting exploration of, again, the backstory from where astrology comes from. But most people who hear like, hey, baby, what's your sign kind of astrology? Have no idea where that comes from. So you wouldn't look at the Adjustment Bureau as a non-astrology geek and say, what does that have to do with astrology? You wouldn't look at the old compass and say that thing. But if you do know the history, you understand that they're drawing from the same source material. Mm-hmm. Then it shows up. And it sounds like the art, the Adjustment Bureau also has a, a streak of uh, what used to be a, a running feature in the magazine, The Mountain Astrologer, which was the notion of a chartectomy, where you could have something removed from your chart. Well, so, well, does, so does the, um, the uh, Golden Compass in a way, because the main plot of the first book in the series is this evil people are chopping people's diamonds away from them so that they have to, so they can control them better. And so when you're cut off from your divine spark, you can't you can't actually live your purpose anymore. You can be forced into somebody else's. Uh, a film that I love that 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 more overtly does this is Celestial Clockwork, which was an international co-production. It's it's French, it's I don't remember what South American country, it's got magic realism in it, it is utterly insane, and it's a retelling of Cinderella, basically. And the, the Celestial Clockwork is a series of events taking the protagonist to the inevitable. And it's things happening. No matter what she does, things keep happening. 
that push her in a certain way. Uh, Chat GPT says a young woman's life is guided by her astrological signs. Well, I'm not so sure that was the case, but it is definitely a playing out of there are forces at work and they're sending you here. Doesn't matter what you do. You're going to all, everybody is converging at this one sp uh, point in time space for the culmination that has been predestined. <laughs> it's also hysterical. But sometimes it's not hysterical sometimes they use it as terrifying oh I, so, I agree i meant celestial compass is a really amusing film i i uh when the x files came out i quickly became an ex filiac can you say that now does that have totally different meanings <laughs> than it did way back then when the internet was first being created um so i love the x files and i remember the episode syzygy where the uh, there was an alignment of stars in the sky that was giving these two teenage girls um, telekinesis mind control kinds of weird powers that of course being teenage girls they were using to manipulate you know the people in their high school the teenage boys and everything else um and as long as it was in alignment it was also causing you know chaos and friction between Mulder and Scully and they were constantly sniping at each other the whole episode which makes the episode a horror a comedy within the horror scape that was the X-Files um, so it's a fun plot they even and they have so many little tropes in it like the mascot for the high school is a Capricorn goat um, but it's also like you know the the goat horns, a, a satanic sign. So they have these themes all the way through. And my, of course, favorite, looking back on it, is that um, uh, Ryan Reynolds was in the first five minutes of the X-Files episode back when he was like 19 or 20 years old. And he, he uh, they're at a funeral and uh, two of the girls who were possessed said they were terrified because they were sacrificing virgins and he offers to take them home. And they said, on the way on the car drive, they say something like, um, uh, do you think we'd be less afraid if we weren't virgins? And there's just such a classic Ryan Reynolds facial expression of I'm driving, what did they say? And like looking over at them, the next thing you see is the car like swinging off the road really fast. And I'm like, you know, Deadpool was born in that moment in time. <laughs> so, um, if you want to check it out for yourself, just you know, put in the um, put in the search engine of YouTube, Ryan Reynolds and Syzygy, or Ryan Reynolds and the X Files, and I'm sure you'll see the clip of the episode, and you'll know what I mean. So that whole episode was about the power of astrology or the power of celestial alignments in a very definite kind of way. Mm -hmm. Did they mention it ever again in the X Files? Not really. Um, is that a full up explanation of astrology? Not really. But it was super fun. That's the way that it usually ends up. It usually shows up. And, and and while you've been saying this, another another category has occurred to me, and it's a, it's a looser one, uh, and that is working astrology in somehow uh, as a sign of being edgy or counterculture. And the specific um, incident that I think of or the specific film is Bell, Book, and Candle, which has the Zodiac Club in the village, which is where Jack Lemmon's young warlock character likes to go. Uh, and that was a coding for homosexuals. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that just kind of meant this is someplace a little outside the norm of culture. And I would imagine that there's all, all kinds of stuff that you could come across from the 60s and the early 70s that would fit that too like oh wow this is just really cosmic but i'm so not th there is another way of looking at it the astrology that's represented in the movies is also emblematic of how accepted astrology is in the culture at the time that the movie was created oh that's true so i would imagine since astrology is more prolific at this moment in time there are more television shows probably created recently where people make little asides about their astrology chart for the day. Uh, they just drop them in in places. I would imagine in the 60s, they probably had something similar. Although I think my absolute favorite is that, uh, that I came across in that list was the, um, in 1968, they released Astro Zombies. <laughs> and the, uh, the B movie where the 
the uh, mad scientist who was creating these zombies used used astrology to program their brains. <laughs> so yeah. I'm sure this is a commentary on you know that movement that produced all the tropes of the 60s, you know, the star scrolls and everything else that were going on back then. Oh, the star scrolls. Oh, I remember those. Uh, we're going to stop right here and take our break and hang around, folks. We'll be back with more ridiculous job owning about astrology in the movies and on TV. See if what you love shows up in our talk. Welcome back to Celestial Compass. I'm Kathy Veal, and we're talking today with Donna Woodwell. It's showtime, astrology in the movies and TV. And uh, we might as well just dive into the big elephant in the room, going back to the notion of uh, uh, astrology being deliberately used in creating something. Um, Harry Potter is a Leo on purpose. And what else happened in those in those books and in those movies? Yeah, well, I mean, we all know that J.K. Rowling did some research in the occult, the metaphysical tradition of the Western world in order to create the books. And so I think she put in little Easter eggs along the way, you know, name dropping, you know, actual real life alchemists and so on to flesh out. You mean, why, why invent a whole fictional world when you can actually use the strange and bizarre from our world to fill it out for you. So um, Harry is a is a Leo. He's in a house, Gryffindor, which uh, whose mascot is a griffin, which is part lion, part eagle, eagle, both birds that are associated with, with in, in some ways with Leo. Um, his best friend, Hermione, is a Virgo. And of course, she's the I want to get it all done and I need to I need to have a time turner in order to take multiple classes at once. So she's she's very classic in her Virgo-ness. Um, Hermione's love interest is Harry's other best friend, um, who happens to be a Pisces, which of course is the opposite of Virgo. Um, so they put these little things in the plot. And even when they go to divination class, one of their things is, a, one of their spoofs is about learning how to draw astrology charts and how hard, how hard it is and how, you know, um, nobody likes doing it. <laughs> so um, there are little things peppered through the show. I mean, through, through the books that um, some of them make, some of them make the plot of the movie, some of them don't. Um, but it's, I think it is an example of at least recognizing that there is a long magical astrological tradition and putting it up on screen as slight as, as more than just, you know, an aside that someone mentions, oh, I read my horoscope. Um, it's more central to the overall plot, even if it isn't quite the plot. And the houses are clearly associated with elements, if not specific signs. I mean, Slytherin's uh, Scorpio, but you know, that's water. Being able to see things and Ravenclaw is air and uh, Hufflepuff uh, is uh, earth. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, my, uh, I have a friend who has virtually everything in Virgo that's not in Libra, and he is definitely Hufflepuff. Yeah, so Hufflepuff is Taurus and Ravenclaw is Aquarius and Slytherin is Scorpio. Yeah, they did. She did it on purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's the same as the uh, uh, the four directions, the four books of the Bible. It's looking at the uh, Wheel of Fortune card on the tarot with the uh, figures. And it's all there. It's all there. Right there. Right there in this book that an entire generation or two has been read to <laughs> at night, growing up. It's hard to do, if you think of astrology from the force of archetypes, meaning that when in astrology, we talk about the planets as kind of archetypal energies themselves. So those concepts of being mercurial and all the characters that that's attached to or Venusian and all the characters that the femme fatale is or the, or the, the, the inspiring beauty is attached to, or Marshall for Mars, which is all of the aggressive um, military strongman types. All of it, if you go down the list, those archetypes are embedded in Western culture and it's very difficult to 
avoid bringing them in some places in your story, especially if the story has been, um, if it's using tropes from Hollywood, the standard, I mean, these are, these are central casting ideas. <laughs> I think that's the words that you use for, for talking about astrology. They're just, they're stock people that you put into a, a script. If you don't exactly know, you just want a placeholder there, or you're just not really interested in going to complicated depth of character. And they do show up over and over again in different places, which is why I mentioned the board game Clue. Um, you can easily make the case that the six characters Clue that people can have to like move around the board are related to planets. You have Mrs. White, who is the maid who is supposed to be taking care of everyone, and she is the moon. We have a Colonel Mustard who gets Mars. We have Miss Scarlet who gets Venus. And then looking at the assorted other characters, we have a Professor Plum, a, um, uh, we have uh, Mr. Green, and we have the other woman who's, oh, she was made, she was made in that movie so beautifully. What was her name? Do you know, do you remember the movie? This is his fire, flames, flames. I'm like Madeline Kahn's character. Madeline Kahn, yeah. So she's a she is a widow, uh, and so if you put widow with Saturn, um, Professor Plum can get the book, so he can be Mercury, um, who was Christopher Lloyd, right? Um, and the last one, uh, Mr. Green, I think he was a banker or something like that. Yeah, that's good. bankers are tr traditionally associated with Jupiter for like you know the having lots of money. So there we have, we have all the planets except for the sun. And who is the sun? Um, depends on how you put it out there, either Mr. Body, the one who's dead, or in the case of uh, the actual movie version, of course, it's Tim Curry because he's running around, you know, orchestrating the entire show, which the sun does. So you could make that case for ast astrology being underneath it, even if nobody thought about it at the time they were doing it, because that is just how these archetypes work. They are pervasive into how we divide up the cosmos and the way we understand it because we've been doing it for thousands of years. I'm My mind is just blown with the notion that the characters in Clue are planets. That has never occurred to me. I will now look at it differently. <laughs> well, my pleasure to do something fun. I think yeah. about this all the time. <laughs> All right. Um, were there, so we've got, I've got like six pages of chat generated notes here in addition to my own. Were there other uh, things that this search turned up where you went, oh yeah, I forgot that or uh, what? There's a lot of things on the AI generated list that I'd never heard of before. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, you should, you should do they have show notes for this? They must have show notes. You should put in your show notes what those um, some, some of those lists are so people can go and research it for themselves. And oh, like, you know what? I will add yeah. that. I will add that. Um, so looking through this myself, there were a number of things that I have seen and my reaction is, what? And the two that just jump out is, I didn't see, did I miss this? Are Love Actually and Chocolat? What? How are they? I remember it vaguely in Chocolat, but it was more of the because the main character was kind of magical, like she was sort of a an unspoken witch and was interested in just witchy things, that this was more like in the background of the witchy things um, that she was interested in. But I don't think it was like totally overt. I think the magic was more overt. Oh, clearly the magic was very overt. <laughs> Uh, Earth Girls are easy. I remember two things about that film and not astrology. <laughs> I remember Gina Davis <laughs> setting that bowling ball into the microwave and causing it to explode. That was very satisfying. And uh, walking out of the theater and saying to my friends that um, an alien landing in a pool in my backyard was far more likely than finding a guy I wanted to date. So uh, <laughs> in Houston at that point. Um uh, do you remember any astrological connection? According to Chat GPT, there is one. I. It's been so long. Right. So it's, 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 my, it's it's like it hasn't stuck except for the except for the title. Uh, the Simpsons, which of course has covered 
everything. The Simpsons is like the greatest predictor of our future and society, uh, apparently. And I don't remember this one. And this was back when I watched it religiously. Marge becomes obsessed with astrology, leading to comedic situations as she tries to navigate life's challenges. You remember this? I am not a big fan of The Simpsons. I'm sorry. I hate to say that. Okay, well, um, but um, I saw that on the episode list and the title is Bart Star. And so I actually went on the internet and looked up reviews of Bart Star. Um, and so apparently it was the episode where um, Bart is playing uh, a sport and Homer is yelling at his coach saying he's terrible. And so um, the coach says, I bet you can't do it better. And Homer says, yes, I can. And takes over this, this the, you know, Bart's sporting team and basically makes Bart the, the star the game you know in 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 the classic act of nepotism and so crazy crazy this is so bart star is a is a double entendre for the plot of that episode where bart is the star of the team and his mother is doing astrology on the side um so i don't know if it's entirely the plot um but i think they probably put it in there because you know Bart Star. How can we explore this idea? That would smell like The Simpsons. <laughs> um, and there's some others with shows that I watched a lot that I have no recollection of. Uh, Dwight Schrute on The Office using astrology to manipulate his office mates. I'm going to have to find this episode. Because... <laughs> that sounds fun. It does sound fun and uh, doesn't sound like Dwight except that he's devious and so maybe he just... Uh... <laughs> I do remember the Friends episode okay. where they were trying to come up with the with the chart for the uh, for the kiddo. So um, I don't remember it well, but I do remember it happening. Um, I wasn't nearly as as involved with astrology back then, um, so I couldn't critique it for you at this moment. But time. that puts it in the time period of when this sort of general topic was becoming much more in the public eye, because that would be after. Charmed and Sabrina the Teenage Witch and yeah, files. Buffy. And so this the general woo was bigger. And so it makes sense that a show like like Friends would do that, which leads to my question that I alluded to earlier. I actually said outright with Harry Potter, what kind of society have we birthed with now a couple of generations that have been raised on these stories and differently than fairy tales that I heard, these are in real world. These are all stories in real world situations. I think this has birthed the witches of TikTok, the, the, the just witchy everywhere. The lunar fair. The, the lunar fair. Yeah, that too. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think uh, they were doing surveys back. Um, already in the 90s, they probably were doing it before. But I remember when I was serving on the astrology board, the 2002 survey that came out, the Harris poll, that um, something like 40% of the people under uh, 25 years old believed in astrology. And I just looked at those numbers, and it was only like 18% um, of the people over 65 believed in astrology. And I was like, yes, yes, because that demographic that demographic movement is going to mean that today, 20 years later, it's now 40% of the people or more who are under the age of 45, you know, just because of the scale always slides, who may believe in astrology um, or magic or tarot or any other things. So it's becoming much more acceptable in our culture to talk about the other things and I, I sometimes have to remind astrologers who are who, like, I can't talk about that where I live because I think I'm demonic. They will think I'm kooky. That statistically speaking, that might be not but might not be the case anymore. I mean, you have like an even money chance at least of talking to someone just by the law of averages that is going to be okay with astrology. So when you realize that you are, I mean, that's about the equivalent of like you know, the liberal conservative divide in the country. And so when you may be more surrounded by people who like these things, why are you still hiding? You know, <laughs> why don't you just say what you're interested in, whether it be 
It's okay to meditate. It's okay to be interested in hands-on healing. It's okay to be interested in other forms of spiritual practices, of which I think we would include astrology as one of them. Um, the stigma just isn't there. Yeah. It is. But then we still have all these shows where people are making fun of astrology um, and the problems that it creates. So strangely, one of the more serious episodes on, on the on the difficulties of what it would be to have an astrology that were that was actually had uh, a world that had actual astrologers in it was in an episode of the Orville. Mm. So, and it came out not that long ago um, where, and of course, the Orville is a parody show that is um, making fun of the Star Trek tropes. But as it's evolved, they've actually gotten into their own and they're they're more serious than they are a complete spoof um, as they go along. So one of the episodes, I think it was in the second season, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, the whole crew of the Orville goes to a planet um, two of the main characters are having birthday and they're trying to decide if they should have a birthday party. Um, and they get to this planet and they are meeting with the leaders of the planet and the people on the planet find out that it was their birthday and they suddenly put them basically in jail, like in, in a labor camp because everyone born under this terrible sign is capable of great evil and we don't want them infecting the rest of the population. So they basically put the equivalent of all the Scorpios in jail. <laughs> and you have to take a place in the society based on the month that you were born in. Um, and so leaders have certain signs and workers have other signs. And of course, all the, all the ones born on the negative sign are in jail. And so they can't get their people out of the labor camp without breaking the, the equivalent of the prime directive. Um, so they do a little bit of research. One of the characters recognizes this this world is just using astrology to, to organize itself. We got rid of that a long time ago, but clearly they are in the grips of this. Um, and so they discovered the reason why they were all afraid of the Scorpio equivalent sign was that because it had a star that had winked out of existence in that area of the sky. And so they go up, and they, it was eaten by a black hole, and they create an artificial star based on a lot of reflective material, and they stick it up in orbit. So the star immediately comes back. Clearly, the star came back, so the sign may not be evil anymore. It's not eating stars, and we'll let your people out of jail, and away they fly. So, I, it was so fascinating to watch on so many levels about the way astrology was being conceived, that it was a tool for fate that everyone bought into what it meant to have a superstition and the foil of a rational society that didn't have it, and yet that it's a superstition, rational people don't believe it, um, still forgets the whole issue of that's not really what astrology is. That's the superficial basic level on it, devoid from its spiritual practice, which is really the challenge that Western society has been in for hundreds of years, kind of splitting apart. You can only be rational or you can only be spiritual and all the things that it leaves out from the equation. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. And, and I'm thinking about something that is that's much more simple as you're saying this. This is reminding me of uh, astrology being used as an organizing principle in the second series a second re a second iteration of Battlestar Galactica because all the planets are named after bastardizations of the sign names that we have now and the only uh and and they have uh like um tribal characteristics that kind of track the the Sagittarius inspired ones show up uh pretty late in the series as they just seem to be fitting and they're all falling prey to, uh, oh gosh, I can't even remember his name now. Uh, the uh, uh, human who had coll uh, colluded with the uh, silence and was trying to take over everything. At any rate, that was, that might've been just more for, oh, isn't this fun? We've done this. Uh, I don't, I don't see it with the great philosophical import that you have just explicated from that episode of the Orville. <laughs> 
Well, there's another example of that, the Divergent series, uh, a Divergent Allegiant and the other one that I can't remember. Um, so in the first, they were based on uh, teen, teen dystopian books. And the first of the series, Divergent, um, the, the main character is growing up. And once you get to a certain age, you were forced to choose your clan. And they have five choices of clans. Well, if you broaden yep. out astrology and think of it in, in it, how it relates to the Chinese five element theory, the five visible planets become the five elements of Chinese astrology or Chinese yep. philosophy. And they did it on purpose. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, Venus is metal star and Mars name is fire star and Jupiter's name is wood star and Saturn's name is star and water star and Mercury. So those are like, the, instead of the four elements, they have five of them and they are planets. So Divergent has five choices that you can go into and guess what? They are planets. You can go to the martial version where everybody runs and wears black and is constantly battling. You can go into the truth telling one, which is one of the attributes of, of uh, Jupiter in traditional astrology. Um, you can go into the intellectual ones where they're always researching and reading books. There we have Mercury. You can go into Amity. Um, Amity is the Venus one where they're all about, you know, love and harmony. Um, and there's a Saturn one, which is ab abdication, abnegation, um, where they all have to give up everything, and only serve the collective. So there you are, your five planets in Divergent, which is a huge movie. Would anyone call it astrological? Probably again, not unless you were people like us talking about these bigger topics, but we get back to those archetypes. They are very difficult to, to avoid, especially if you're sitting down and you're trying to put together clans, um, which comes back to what you just said about Battlestar Galactica. There is only so many ways humans can decide how to divide up the cosmos. And one of the oldest ways is baked into how we think about astrology. And there we have it showing up in a couple of a couple of stories that people can see. Um, so anything else? It's one of the ones where I wish we had like an audience feed because I bet you people would be like, wow, ideas spark as we're talking. They That's could show true. their own... Um, their own discussion of the topic or examples that we haven't even thought of because there are lots of them. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, good grief, uh, Brooklyn 999, a Halloween episode. That's gonna be worth looking for. Um, well, I guess what I would say as we're kind of bringing this to a halt is kind of a challenge to people. Uh, as you're watching movies and things on TV, um, do you see anything archetypal going on? Do you do you start to suspect that hmm, somebody used astrology to structure this? Because I think it happens more uh, again. Final six episodes of Better Call Saul. <laughs> I swear, I want confirmation of this. I swear somebody in that writer's room knew what they were doing. So I challenge people to uh, look at TV from that perspective. Look at what you're streaming. Look at, and, and like, what is this speaking about the current time? Uh, and what, what archetypes are here? And oh my gosh, there really is an astrologer character. Wow, what can we do with this? What does it say about astrologer characters and astrologers in real life? You know, what does it say about what the culture we live in thinks about astrologers? I mean, movies that come out of, say, India are going to have a different ideas about astrologers and their relation. And because in India, there's a long tradition of uh, matrimony, uh, uh, romantic matches, you know, uh, marriages created by uh, the astrological consultant. And I, I'm we didn't even dive into the Indian movie scene because I'm not I'm not a aficionado on the topic, but I'm willing to bet there are lots and lots of Indian movies that mention astrology as part of the movie theme or or just the general conversation that's going on. I I did turn up a lot when I 
did some web searching and they were all films I had, I had not seen. And I'm not, you know, I don't know how widely they distributed. They are in the area that most of uh, my listeners slash viewers are in, but that could be a fun thing to look into. Yeah, if you really wanted a fun doctoral thesis on the interplay of pop culture and astrology, there's plenty of information out there. Please do the work and then write the book so that we can all read it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the piece I love personally, and that I write about a whole bunch. Oops, sorry, right into my camera. Uh, I, I noticed that there is usually there's often a correlation between a person, an actor, a performer, and a character. And there's often a correlation between, uh, especially in biopics, something coming up and that there's a transit in that person's life. Uh, and uh, often there's a connection between the performer or the production. Um, I have a lot of stuff about this on my site. If you go to empowermentunlimited.net under uh, Astro Insight, there's a tag that says articles. Uh, a documentary about Dean Martin coincided with uh, an eclipse that was reactivating his chart. Um, Holland Taylor's performance of a one-woman show about uh, Ann Richards being broadcast on PBS coincided with massive transits for both of them. Um, and it's, so it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. Keeps astrologers in business writing articles, things publications and things well, noticing the synchronicities that are all around us and they're everywhere uh always 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 fun talking with you donna please tell people what you're up to and the many different ways they can um enjoy you <laughs> that also has connotations right I don't mean that. okay <laughs> That's right. What are you doing? What's at your school? Uh, so I am the headmistress talking about Harry Potter of my own magic school. It's called Magic and Mastery. Uh, go to www.magicandmastery.com and you will find lots and lots of ways to follow what I'm doing from all the infinite free stuff. I do office hours once a week to come and do Q&A, open discussions with anybody who wants to come. Um, we have a magical book club that's open again to everybody. Um, I have various subscription programs that are designed for people wherever you are at in your magical explorations, people who just want to meditate monthly with the phases of the sun and the moon, um, people who want to do a deeper dive into the esoteric tradition of the Western of Western culture, people who really want to um, remake their lives. We have our own mastermind. Um, plus, uh, some, some topics are so huge, you just can't talk about them in an hour. So I have graduate level courses on astrology and tarot and magic. So wherever you're at in your journey, Come and play. We have stuff for you. www.magicandmastery.com. And that's perfect timing. Thank you very, very much. I hope you enjoyed it, everyone. Uh, send me messages about what we missed and what else you know about. And uh, see you again soon. Bye.